Well, good morning and happy Thursday. Welcome to this week's edition of Offit Kerman's Remote Rundown. I'm Jim Reese, Director of Business Development at Offit Kerman. And each week I'm joined with Offit Kerman labor and employment attorneys, Sarah Sawyer, Veronica Yu, and usually Russell Berger, who just couldn't be with us today. Uh, so Sarah, you and Veronica are on the spot today uh, for a conversation about the uh, latest and most relevant issues regarding COVID-19 and advice for owners and employers on how to best deal with these issues. Been plenty of development since last week. Uh, so uh, why don't you, Veronica, why don't you uh, start us off and, uh, and, and tell us what's going on since the last week we've spoken. Sure, so on this gloomy Thursday morning, we're gonna do a little PPP update um, a topic we haven't really talked about in a few weeks, but um, just this past August 4th, um, the Small Business Administration finally published the long-awaited guidance that everyone had been anticipating relating to forgiveness, um, and it was recently updated um, just this past August 11th. So this is the latest and greatest from the SBA, um, and I'm going to focus today on the forgiveness frequently asked questions that they've posted. Um, and so those FAQs are basically organized into the following topics, general forgiveness, payroll costs, non-payroll costs, loan forgiveness reductions, and the interplay between economic injury disaster loans and PPP forgiveness. So this morning, I just wanna highlight some of the key takeaways um, from that guidance, um, but I would recommend that everybody take the time to read the FAQs fully. Um, so one thing that's interesting is no payments are going to be due um, on the PPP loans until the entire forgiveness process is completed. So that means your lender has to submit um, the application to the SBA, and until that forgiveness amount is determined, there's not going to be any payments. So as you can imagine, the amount of loans, with the amount of loans and the complexity of the forgiveness program, there's going to be a substantial amount of time between um, when your coverage period ends and when the first payment could be due. Um, to further, you know, add to the lag time, um, a timely forgiveness application can be filed within 10 months after the coverage period ends. So from a strategic standpoint, um, unless you have any other, you know, deadlines that may be at play, you can actually wait to file your forgiveness application more, just from a, from a strategic business standpoint, but also from um, a, a place where we can learn more about how forgiveness is going to work. So it kind of gives you um, a time to pause and understand, you know, what are the next steps with your forgiveness application. Um, one important note is that interest does begin to accrue from the date the loan was dispersed, and that's going to be at a rate of 1%. Um, so even though, you know, there's going to be this lag time, if you do owe um, any amounts that aren't given, there is going to be this interest rate of 1%. Um, and there's also a six-month deferral period to start making payments. Um, so again, the rush here is there, I mean, the takeaway here is there's no apparent rush um, to get that forgiveness application filed unless there's some other deadline that you're working under. Yeah, what I, I've seen is that we've been definitely giving the advice to, to wait because as this guidance has come out and things have been, it's been kind of a moving target. Um, but I've seen with some clients that there is a need to, to, to file sooner. Like I've got a client that's going through a, a merger and acquisition um, deal right now where they are, uh, you know, have, they're, they're selling their, their business and they're, they're doing a bunch of, you know, the housekeeping for that. And the other company that's acquiring them really wants to know, well, is this loan going to be forgiven or not? Because <laughs> otherwise they're going to have to uh, potentially pay for it and, or, you know, that's going to change the terms of the deal. So that was a, an interesting one that I've seen come up uh, that, you know, companies have to consider. And so some of those companies that have to kind of rush to get these things done, they're going to be serving a little bit as the guinea pigs for this whole process and might be, uh, you know, kind of the source of, of additional guidance, depending on how that goes. Hey, Sarah, that's really a good point that I hadn't thought of. Um, so besides uh, M&A, where, um, where the PPP loan or grant may, may come up and may be, you know, a source of, um, of contention, 
Um, where else might the, the PPP loans um, surface uh, that people aren't thinking about? I mean, the interest, I think, is a, an, an interesting point as well, is that, you know, if, if you do think you're going to owe, um, you know, you are going to be acquiring interest. So that is, is something to consider as well. I know I have some clients that uh, they, when they took the loan and started using it, they said, all right, I know I'm going to have to pay some of this back because I'm not going to use it within some of these parameters because it just makes more sense for my business for me not to do that. And so, you know what, I'd rather take the 1% loan and not get everything forgiven. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, and then also just, you know, some, some of the, the, the bookkeeping and, and aspects of things, um, depending on what people's fiscal year is, things like that. So, you know, obviously working, working with your um, accountant and working through the numbers and figuring out if there's a, a timing reason to do it sooner. Um, luckily, we are getting to a point where there's been so much additional guidance that Hopefully, if you are in a position where it makes sense for you to start thinking about filing and, and actually doing that, that we're in a much better position now than we were before. But we could maybe say the same thing again in a couple of weeks, so where uh, we could get new additional information. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot changing, even with the eight week covered period to the 24 week covered period. You know, things change and. The guidance here is going to further define what payroll and non-payroll costs are eligible for forgiveness. Um, you know, the FAQs clarified that when you're calculating cash compensation, you use the gross amount of wages um, as opposed to the net. So these are just some gray areas that um, we were unsure of when the PPP loans were first dispersed. Um, so I definitely recommend um, looking through the new FAQs. Um, just one point that we talked about recently, uh, previously on Remote Rundown is the documentation um, for the full-time equivalent headcounts for people who choose not to return to work. So the FAQ specifically said you need to provide a written offer of rehire, the written record of the offer's rejection, as well as a written record of efforts to hire a similarly qualified individual. Um, so these FAQ, FAQs will help you, you know, better understand what's forgivable. And the last point on PPP that I'll make is um, I noticed that there's an easy form and a regular form for um, forgiveness. So the easy form is just basically a truncated form um, that certain businesses can utilize instead of using the full forgiveness application. And there's instructions on the Treasury site that actually explain who that applies to, um, and there's three discrete instances. It's you know self-employed individuals um, that didn't have employees during this time, if the borrower didn't have to reduce wages by 25% or more, or headcount, um, and then if the borrower is unable to operate during that covered period, um, consistent with CDC guidelines and other safety requirements. So that's something else to look out for when you see the easy form, that's what it means. Um, so I think overall, read the FAQs, um, continue to fully document your costs and any reductions in staffing or wages. Um, and after the dust settles with, you know, the publishing of this new guidance, and as there's a little bit more time, you might want to reach out to your lender to see um, what other guidance they may have on forgiveness application. Well, where can uh, the listeners find these FAQs? Yeah, so I'm actually, when we post our remote rundown, I will post a link to both the SBA's website with the FAQs, and then also um, the, a link to the U.S. Department of Treasury site because it has some really great resources for both borrowers and lenders. Okay. All right, well, this uh, seems like a good place to pause. Um, we usually do our um, uh, key takeaway. So, Sarah, you want to start with key takeaway for today? I'm actually going to toss it back at you, Jim. So I've been, been keeping an eye on your, your LinkedIn lately, and you've been doing a lot of good content on what people should be thinking about as far as marketing and staying relevant out there in this COVID world. So what are your takeaways this week for what people should be doing in the marketing realm? Oh, surprise. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you, you caught me a little off guard, but... Um, I, I have been doing some presentations on uh, virtual networking um, that's sort of my thing. So there's there's a couple of um, a couple of favorite sound bites that I like to leave people with because um, you know when you listen to a 25 or 30 minute presentation, 
uh, I believe that there's there's just a, a few a few sound bites that I like people to to walk away with. So one is, and and these are not necessarily my own um, origination uh, or, or originating um, uh, phrases, but the first one is don't social distance from social media. And what that means is get involved. Um, even if you're an introvert and you're not exactly comfortable, uh, for example, of, 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 uh, on, on LinkedIn, I suggest that you, you know, spend a little bit of time, uh, maybe one day a week, uh, spend 20 minutes, comment on some, some posts, um, like some posts, share some posts, and then when when you have time, write some original content to put out on LinkedIn and just get yourself comfortable doing it. Um, it's really the, the best thing we have right now because virtual is, is going to be it for a while. And um, I, I suggest that people not be a lurker. A lurker is someone who goes on Facebook or LinkedIn, looks around, sees what's going on, looks at pictures, but never likes or comments or shares. So get out of your comfort zone a little bit, take some a few minutes a, uh, a week and start getting involved. Um, secondly, I love to um, suggest to people that when they do connect virtually and then eventually by phone or, um, or by video conference, whatever it might be, even a, a coffee meeting, if you feel safe, be interested, not interesting. So someone who's interested is curious, is asking all the questions. Someone who's interesting is talking about themselves all the time. We've all been in those conversations where they're one way, where the other person like is nonstop talking about themselves and doesn't even take a break to say, oh, so what do you tell me about you and what do you like to do and what's your role at Offit Kerman, et cetera. So be curious, be interested, not interesting. Uh, wait for someone to, to ask you about what you do and that gives you sort of permission to uh, proceed. And then last is, um, and this is a really good one, that, um, you know, what, what is networking? Well, networking is about knowing more people, um, but connecting is about knowing people more. So you flip flop the word more and people. Uh, networking is, a, is a, a, a quantity thing. You're networking, you're at a, in a Zoom call with 30 or 40 people. But connecting is what you do after you network and you follow up with someone and you, you make that, that phone meeting or a Zoom meeting and eventually maybe a coffee meeting. And those extra touches really allow you to start to build a relationship with someone. So again, networking is about knowing more people. Connecting is about knowing people more. So those are some of my tips for virtual networking. Thanks for asking, Sarah. I'm yeah. glad I was prepared for that. But, uh, <laughs> this, yeah. is, this is my realm. Yeah, um, I just have, sharing. I have one question. Yeah. What is what's your, what are your thoughts on personal posts on a professional network like LinkedIn? Uh, I think that's a great question, and I have a good answer because I'm I'm guilty of it. Uh, but I say that I'm proud to be guilty of it. In fact. Yesterday or the day before was National Middle Child Day, and I am a middle <laughs> child. And I posted a picture. Yeah, right. I posted a picture of me and my older brother and younger sister, and I posted on Facebook and LinkedIn with a little note. You know, ha you know, National Middle Child Day. Um, I love being the middle child. What do you think? Who else is a middle child? Because um, we get a bad rap. Uh, oftentimes, but I think, especially in in, in um, during the pandemic, people really want to connect on a personal level, and they they want to know you know what you are about. They want to. It's okay to to be to show some vulnerability. Um, you you got to be yourself. You got to be authentic. But people want to connect on a personal level, and I think it's important. I talk about my grandkids and my kids and my wife and my siblings all the time. And I think it sort of rounds out the, what the whole package is. And people want to know what you do outside of being a lawyer or being a BD person or whatever. whatever. So I, I, I am very much in favor that, you know, everything in, in moderation, 
but yes, I think it's uh, it's okay to post some personal stuff on LinkedIn. Thanks, Good questions. Yeah, thank All right, well, we'll see you next week. And are we gonna have Russell back next week? I believe so, yeah, I think he'll be back okay. with us. He's probably home practicing now. <laughs> All right, well, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.